1887, Dr. Mari, who had made the scientific study of motion his life work, devised a repeater camera to enable him to photograph successive phases of a given movement. How near he came to the threshold of a new discovery, the invention of cinematography, you can see here. Simply by projecting his photographs onto the screen at the speed they were taken, we are able to reproduce the original movement. Although Dr. Mari did not discover how to do this himself, those who did owed much to his pioneer work. The first of these early inventors to give a public display of their apparatus were the Lumiere brothers. When this film was shown in the first Lumiere program, it created a sensation. C'est la vie elle-même, cried the astonished audience. This is life itself. But those fashion. From the very beginning, the cinematograph was apparently recognized as a new source of entertainment. Even in the first Lumiere program, we find the Lumiere's gardener and his son acting as the screen's first comedian. When the mere mechanics of cinematography ceased to be a nine days wonder, producers conceived the idea of making films of dramatic episodes and stories. In England, one of the earliest and most successful story films was this reenactment of exploits from the life of our famous national murderer, Charles Peake. According to modern standards, this is pure slapstick, but it was made at the time as serious drama. About the same time, melodrama made its debut in America with the great train robbery, a tremendous success in its day. Producers also made films on the lines of the cheap romantic novelette. This is where we hit the villain. screen melodramas that producers became even more ambitious and attempted to introduce art into the cinema by filming well-known stage players. The assassination of the Duke of Guise was the first of many such photo plays in which famous actors and actresses patronized the studios. The dialogue of the play was inserted by numerous subtitles. seen how exaggerated and even comic their performances would appear to us today, they might not perhaps have chosen to immortalize themselves in this way. Nevertheless, in their own day, they did lend a measure of distinction and respectability to the new medium. By now, however, the story film had entirely lost that contact with reality which had had so much to do with the cinema's early success. To find that, we must look elsewhere.
Cinematography has given us a new means of recording historical events. One of the wonders of a new age, it appears just in time to capture for us this glimpse of the close of an old one. Never again did any capital see such a parade of kings and emperors. This was the London of the early 1900s, when the outstanding cry was vote for women. All the films we have seen till now, of course, were made as silent. Let us take a jump forward for a moment and look at a sound newsreel made only a few years ago. We return through 25 years to the silent film again. Here is another type of non-fiction film, the always popular scientific interest film. Not only did films help to popularize science, but they were of service to the scientist himself. Dr. Canty, for instance, made considerable use of the film in his researches into cancer. By speeded up photography, he was able to condense lengthy organic processes into the space of a few minutes, and so make them visible for the first time to the human eye. The old Secrets of Nature series is still being continued as a sound film series under a new name, Secrets of Life. The man responsible for the fascinating shots of growing plants and microscopic organisms which these films bring to the screen is Percy Smith. Here he has turned his camera onto the ordinary dandelion, while the soundtrack is used for descriptive commentary. In this case, I have the doubtful pleasure of introducing myself doing my own job. In France, similar work has been done by Jean Panlevé, who specializes in the photography of marine life. This sequence from one of his recent sound films on the sand shrimps is characteristic of this poetic treatment of reality. The music is by Maurice Chaubert. <laughs> Once more, we are back again to the early silent days, to another kind of film which has always been very popular, the ordinary interest film. This one, sponsored by the London and Northwestern Railway, might almost be regarded as grandfather of our present-day British documentary. there were the travel films. These glimpses of an execution and a burial in Imperial China must have had a strange fascination for the audiences of 1909. In these days of glorious technicolor and the voice which is forever bidding farewell to the natives of this place or that, we are apt to take travelogues for granted. But at that time they were still so novel and exciting that small cinemas designed as railway carriages and even given the jolting movements of a train ran programs consisting entirely of travel films.
First World War, the film camera was officially mobilized and called upon to do new and exciting work. It became a war correspondent. Here you see Linden Post, where so many prisoners and wounded were brought in after the Battle of the Somme. Incidents such as this were afterwards fitted into full-length films. The Battle of the Somme, together with Mons, Ypres, the battles of the Carmel and Falkland Islands, Tibruga and Armageddon, all achieved a wide success and were even seen by thousands of people who did not ordinarily go to the cinema. The realist film was no longer merely an unimportant fill-up for the film program. Full-length interest film had come to stay.